That was a wonderful introduction, correct? I was like, is, is that me? So again, like you said, I'm going to talk about my triumph. Of so when I was in middle school, I was hit by a car. Now the car was going 80 miles per hour in reverse. I was just sitting in front, waiting for my parents to pick me up from school, like any middle school child. But until that moment, when the car backed up, it crashed into both of my legs. So both of my legs were crushed in between the gate in the bumper of the car. I had to hop over the car, but my leg got caught. And at that same very moment, I tried to grab my friend's arm so that she wouldn't get hit either, but it was too late. The car smashed directly in front of her face, so she was, she was already dead. Everyone started saying, help, 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 help. And I was on the ground. I couldn't talk. The impact of the ground, I hit my head so hard, I wasn't able to function. So as I, let, as I went into the nurse's office, she was scrambling through papers, scrambling through papers. Let me find her mom, her parents, her parents. Let's find, call the ambulance. I couldn't talk. She was like, are you OK? Are you OK? I just sat there, froze. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't even remember my name. And then the ambulance came. And then the moment that the ambulance came, they start checking me, checking me. Are you OK? Are you OK? Are you OK? But I couldn't say anything. And my legs were scrunched together. I couldn't even move them. And they couldn't even pick. They had to up on the gurney because I couldn't walk. At that moment, I see my cousin coming out, coming out of the school. He's like, Ray, Ray, what's happening? What's happening? What's going on? He's crying, he's crying, he's crying. But I couldn't talk to him. But I seen the pain on his face, the agony and how it really hurt him. At that moment, I knew I probably was going to die. Hospital, rushing the hospital, going, going, going. Everyone's pulling, 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 sucking, sucking, sucking. Room one, room one, two, 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 doctor, doctor. I get in the room, the doctor is there, and my parents jump in. They come in, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? And it's panicking. She see me on the bed with my legs bent back. And she says, what is happening? How this happened? We were just supposed to pick her up. How was it, was it? And she's crying, 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 crying. And I can see the life being ripped out of her, being that I'm her only daughter. And my dad's there. And my grandfather automatically begins to pray. Heavenly Father, this is your daughter. You have to survive. You have to bring her back. You said that she will be great. You said that she would do great things. You said that she would inspire others. She can't die like this, now that she's young. And my dad's trying to ask the doctors, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? How did this happen? Ask her questions, and the doctor says, I don't know. But she's probably never going to be able to walk again. Never. So anything that she has accomplished, it's done, because she won't be able to do anything. She probably will never be able to speak again, let alone run. And at that time in my life, I was running, and I was doing really well. I had medals, I was traveling, and a doctor was saying, she probably would never do any of that again. So then my dad began to pray. And my dad's like, Heavenly Father, how is this possible? You have to bring her back. It's no way that she can die like this. And as I am, I'm unconscious for about four hours. I couldn't move, but I can see and hear everything that was happening but I couldn't talk to them. And I just wanted to reach out and talk to my mom and say, Mom, I love you. If I have to die, I want you to know that I love you. And Dad, everything that you have done for me up until this point, I thank you. But I couldn't say anything. I just laid there. And in that moment, I heard a voice from above. The voice was very soft, very subtle. He said, my daughter, my precious, beloved daughter, do you want to live or do you want to die? Because if you live, you live, someone else will have to bear the burden of you being able to walk, to talk, to breathe, to run, to live, to think on your own. But if you die, then the world will lose out on the impact that I have into you. They won't be able to get the gifts that I have desired for you to give. So it will be a lose-lose. And then your parents will remorse forever. 
knowing that their daughter died so young. So I thought to myself, I said, well, Father, I would rather die. I would rather be dead than to see my parents struggle with medical bills to pay for me, for to help me. And I would rather die just to see someone else carry the burden of me, of my pain. Dying seemed better. But then the voice again, my daughter, I love you. And I thank you. You are amazing that you were willing to die so that someone else can live. And he said, you're going to live, and you're going to walk again, and you're not going to be paralyzed, and you're not going to be brain dead. You're going to be smart, you're going to be energetic, and you're going to inspire millions of people. But with that, you have to understand that you have to live your life every day for me. Every day. You won't fit into the every, you won't fit in, you won't fit in with everyone else. Things that other people do, you won't be able to do. And not everyone will understand you because your purpose is greater. And you have to be okay with being different. And moment, I woke up. <gasps> life was brought back into my body. I grabbed my parents and I hugged my mom as if I was giving her her life back because I knew that her life was ripped out of her. And I walked out of the hospital on both of my legs and walked out. And then I asked, what happened to my friend? Is she okay? Because in my mind, I was more concerned about her than I was concerned about me. But they said it was too late for her. Then at that moment, I realized that my destiny is bigger than me. My self-being is greater than me. And I decided to live my life that way. So as I went to school, I was in special education. Now, while my time in education, I've seen how, I saw how teachers were, they taught in a way that didn't matter, as if those students were incapable of doing anything. And I told my professor one time, I said, you know, I want to travel the world. I want to go across nations. I want to motivate people. I want to inspire people. I want people to look at, look at me and say, because of you, I didn't give up. And he laughed at me. He says, Araya, <laughs> that would never happen. You are nothing. You're worth nothing. You're better off dead. Because people of your, of your kind, you have no purpose in life. Why are you even here? You're never going to travel to no one. No one will ever listen to you. And I said, that's probably right. And it's because I'm different, and that's OK. But when I do travel the world, and when I do lecture to people, talk to people, I'm going to come back. And we can have the same conversation years later about my purpose. And we'll see if you say the same thing. And then he laughed and said, <laughs> We'll see about that. I said, we will. We will. And I, and I meant that with every bone in my body. We will. Still plan on emailing him and seeing him now. <laughs> I mean, you have to. So my present, knowing that I'm supposed to be paralyzed, obviously, I'm walking in front of you guys. My legs work, right? I'm in college. I'm graduating in the spring. I have traveled the world. I have, my brain is not damaged. Every school that I have went to, I have been on the dean's list. Every quarter, nothing less. I have went to Africa, Uganda. I taught in the prisons. I taught about economics, politics, policy, sociology, healing and forgiveness. I taught in the school of disabled. I taught them about the ways, the English, math, science. Things that are exciting. If my brain was terrible, I wouldn't be able to do any of that at all. These miracle legs, and yes, I call them miracle legs, they have traveled nations. I went to Africa. I, went, I, I walked in the Nile River, the longest river in the world. I stood on the top, right there on the mountaintop. I traveled to Dubai in the deserts of Dubai. That's awesome. So uh, I wonder, what will my teacher say now? 
Mm. Right? That's cool. That's awesome. But in that, I learned that my purpose is bigger than me. And I have to live in that each and every day. So my future. The thing that I desire the most out of getting this out to you guys and everyone else across the world is never settling. I learned not to settle. It's okay to be different. It's okay. You won't be like everyone else. And I learned that especially through track. Because during track, track is really competitive. And people say if you don't do, if you don't start track when you're young, you won't accomplish anything. But again, that's not true. Most of the schools I have went to, I have set two records. And now I'm at Cal Poly and I'm working on setting the third one and taking it. Yeah, I am. And it's gonna happen. And you know why? Because I'm so determined and I'm so driven. I'm going to stop at nothing until I get every single thing that everyone said I would never be able to do. So I like when people say you can't do something. I like that because that makes me hungry. So the message that I'm giving here today to everyone else through my triumph, through my conquer, is saying that anything that you desire to do, do it, pursue it. Dare to dream bigger. Because if we begin to build a generation of people who can dream big something, nothing is impossible to us at that point. And that's it's almost like a quote when my grandmother said. She says, oh, honey, I don't ever think we would see a black president. Long time ago, long, long time ago. And this is back during the civil rights movement. And, now, and then when Obama was elected president, he was in office, I said, Grandma, how do you feel? And she says, I feel like the impossible has been made possible. And I said, you know what? You're right. Things are only impossible to people and to the way we see things because it has never been done before. But the moment that we see things to be done, it's possible now. So now your possibilities are endless. So that's, that was, that's the message that I want to give out today, is whatever you desire to do in life, do it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how hard it is, how impossible you think it is. Pursue it. And then once you pursue your impossible thing and you make it possible, it is. And then go out and help the next person pursue their thing that's impossible. Because if, if I do my thing that's impossible and I help someone else do their thing that's impossible, nothing, we have no limitations at all. Now limitations are endless. So for, I'm gonna go to law school. I am, and I'm gonna graduate top of my class, and I'm gonna be a Supreme Court judge. I'm gonna do that, definitely, definitely. And I like that. And then once I begin to do that, I'm going to help the next generation pursue their dreams as well. Because my whole thing is, if I be great, I want everyone to be great around me. What's the point of just being great by myself? It's not good enough for me. I want everyone to pursue their dreams, whatever it is. So if I'm great, I want you to be great. And then my thing is, if you're great, make somebody else great. Help them in whatever avenue they can. Because then at that point, we're building a generation of people who care, people who love, and people who do not live in fear. Because fear is one of the biggest things that hinder us. Fear, doubt, defeat, what people say. So forget about the naysayers. Forget what they say. So what? Be different. Be you, be genuine and true to who you are and pursue whatever you want to do. So dare to be different. Dare to have the audacity to go out there and pursue whatever you want to do. Be a conqueror.